Hello, we are standing from the Hiroshima Castle. Uh, last time I was here was during cherry blossom season in 2014. Well, I shot like, I think 2,000, 3,000 pictures of cherry blossoms. Um, that when I was shooting that, I, w I knew I could never show it to my professor because uh, he would say like it's not real journalism, just cherry blossom pictures, but uh, they were really pretty. Fritz Schumann is a talented visual journalist who has done a lot of writing and documentaries and films and photography on Japan. I had the chance to catch up with Fritz a couple times to talk about his documentary film about Okunoshima Rabbit Island and the history of poison gas there. Uh, this time I had the chance to catch up with Fritz in person when he was on a visit uh, around Japan researching a new book. So I was living, first time I moved to Japan was in 20, 2009, 2009-2010 in Tokyo. And then I came back once a year and then I became an exchange student at the Hiroshima City University here between 2013 and 2014. And then again came back once a year to do research, just to meet friends, until uh, Corona hit and then I couldn't come back anymore. So last time I was here, I was actually in Hiroshima uh, for the premiere of my film about Okunoshima. Uh, I was at the Hiroshima International uh, Film Festival and I got invited in November 2019. And if I would have known that would gonna be the last time I can go to Japan, I would have stayed longer. Uh, but fortunately I was able to come back now. Uh, so this time I said I'm gonna stay for at least two months just to make the most of it. The release of the film was quite the journey. Um, I finished the edit four days before it was shown here in Hiroshima and I was I had a job in Copenhagen and so I was doing the job working all day and then at night exhausted like doing like the final touches to the film uh, so I can send it to Hiroshima so they can prepare the files and everything and then I arrived in Hiroshima in November my luggage arrived three days later, so the outfit I had for the world premiere of my film that I worked on for six years um, wasn't here, so I just bought something you know, cheap and black from Uniqlo and it worked. Um, and there was the world premiere of my documentary about Okunoshima. And I had another screening in Hiroshima at my old university uh, in front of a group of like, I forgot how many it was, like 100, 200 students. And then the idea was first to take a break, <laughs> to catch my breath, uh, and then send it to other film festivals and send it to the media, because I want to publish the film. But both things didn't really go well. Like I sent it into some contests. Um, I sent it to WordPress Photo to, for the digital storytelling uh, category. It made it to the second round, but it wasn't nominated. Um, I, a, an Italian journalism contest picked it up and it got nominated for uh, the category investigative story um, with two other stories but didn't get the prize unfortunately and the media I pitched it to like they weren't they weren't super interested because some said the story is so long ago, like it happened during World War II, I would argue it still affects the present and uh, Japanese politics today. Um, and especially German media said, okay, well, where's like, where's the German angle? Well, why should Germans care about the story? And besides like a bigger issue of responsibility for the war and like Germans were allies of Japan, uh, Japan was inspired by Germany to produce poison gas, they got active help from Germany. Um, it was hard to literally sell the idea of this film and I talked to some media and for around a year and I found one that agreed to do the story and was one media I really liked but through the whole process of the editor like the story that I wanted, they wanted to publish got smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually I said like it's better not to publish on these terms than, than um, yeah, then just like have a small publication of like six years of work. So, after a year or so of trying, I kind of gave up and not really giving up, but like I had to digest the emotional 
uh, consequences and the emotional backblow of like not releasing this work and I mean just imagine investing six years of your life and talking to so many people and these people placing you and their hope in you to tell their story um, and that not having not being able to tell that story uh, that was pretty difficult and I had to really like properly process that and this took a uh, good part of a year just to uh, so I just can be able to um, look at the material again without like feeling uh, the guilty conscious or feeling I don't know um, feeling like a failure so last year I kinda got the I think I properly processed that and it's like okay look um, I want people to see this film. I don't care if I get paid for it. It would have been nice like to recoup my costs because it took a lot of money to produce everything <laughs> and lots of my time. But I said like, hey, whatever. The, I, I don't care about like getting rich. I care about like showing this film, showing this story. Um, so I figured, okay, what can I do? I can publish it for free online so people can watch it. But I figured, okay, the, the film is like 30 minutes long might be too long for online, for online media, maybe I should shorten it a bit. So I commissioned two editors, I paid them. <laughs> um, so more costs to the production of the film, so they can produce um, a shortened version of it. Which is also good like to get an outside perspective, because I did basically everything by myself. Research, producing, shooting, editing, uh, and so on. Um, but it took a while for me like, to be able to look at the stuff and to properly get back into it again. Um, so it wasn't until this year, July, when I first looked at it again. Um, and eventually I saw their, their versions, around 20 minutes. And it didn't feel right, it was missing like certain important points. And for example, one editor, uh, I'm interviewing a couple of people in, for this film. And one editor uh, erased the Chinese scholar from the film, which makes sense from editor point of view, because he's the only one that's not connected to all the others. Um, and it's an outside perspective, but I think a story about Japanese poison gas being transported and used in China needs a Chinese perspective. So I didn't feel comfortable to release that. Um, so eventually I took some notes from them, like they, they um, switched some images that I liked um, and fixed some things in the pacing that I adapted. Um, but eventually I decided to stick with the 30 minute version. And then you came along <laughs> and you wrote to me, it's like, hey Fritz, I've been recently to Okunoshima, let's do a follow up. And I was figuring, okay, um, we, it only makes sense to make a follow-up if the film is finally online. Because uh, so many people that saw the interview with me wrote to me, it's like, hey, I want to see your film. And all the people that wrote to me, uh, I sent the link to the film. But it would have been so much easier if I have the link publicly available. So he wrote to me, hey, let's do a follow-up. I was like, okay, it only makes sense if I publish the film, so why not, why not do that? <laughs> So, um, I decided to um, set up a dedicated website, akunashima.video, where you can see the film, um, cleaned up the, the English version for the film, uh, made the website available in three languages, and was online. Um, so yeah, it feels, it feels good. That, that, and I was really surprised how active the reactions were on social media. So many people wrote to me, so many people watched it. Um, and I set up a donation button at the uh, bottom of the page. I'm not actively asking for donations because I'm, I'm fine, I can pay my rent, I got food. Um, it's more like, hey, if you like that, it would be nice like, to get, I don't know, three bucks or something. And recently, um, two weeks ago, I did a remote talk um, about this film at a Japanese scholar convention in Germany and after that uh, talk um, I got a you know somewhat nice donation I was like wow this is, this is, this is so surprising <laughs> so it's exactly five the museum is closing <laughs>
Um, last time I was on the island was in 2018 when I finished the, the filming. Um, so, like in one way it was weird to come back because many things felt the same. In other areas it was very much different because there's less tourism now, less foreign tourists for sure. Uh, and less bunnies. <laughs> I noticed that. Uh, that because the, the bunnies on the island, they they need the tourists and the people to come in to survive. And I heard that that the people, or the staff from the hotel, during winter times when there less uh, previously when there were less visitors, they feed them because they rely on humans. So less tourists means less food, less bunnies. Um, they might have been hiding from the heat, but even in the evenings or early, or when it was a bit colder or shady, there were much, much less bunnies than before. So you can already see like the impact of the tourism ban that Japan has imposed on the bunnies on the famous Bunny Island, which is a weird side effect. Have you had any connection with the people in your film since you came back to Hiroshima? Yes, Island? on the island I met again with Mr. Uh, Yamochi. And uh, Mr. Yamuchi, uh, he was very, uh, yeah, uh, as people in Japan express emotions differently than in Germany, I would say, but he was very happy. <laughs> he, he was uh, guiding a tour group, as he does, um, throughout the island, just telling, there were a group of, um, let's say, peace students um, from Tokyo and he was giving a tour to them and he was showing my film to them so they they came up to me and they were they looked quite moved and they thanked me for my film and when i finished the film in 2019 i invited um, samuchi to the film festival as well but he couldn't come uh, and when i um when i finished like a previous draft i sent it to him and asked him like hey is this okay for you and he was very he was polite but his answer was very short so i assumed like he didn't like the film but now coming back and meeting him, he's telling me like he's showing my film as often as he can to as many people as he can because he's very proud of it, um, and that he's so happy that I made it, and he's so happy that like you know, a young person from Germany made it, um, and yeah, it was was <laughs> uh, I didn't expect that, um, and it was was great meeting him again, uh, seeing how happy he is, and when I knew I was going back to Japan. And I knew I was going back to Okunoshima. Um, when that decision was made in Germany, I wrote to him, and he replied to me like right away. He's like, "Hey Fritz, when you come, let's meet." I was like, "Cool!" <laughs> and I felt so great after so many years. Like I met him the first time in 2014, and now I met him again eight years later. And like we, we talked a bit about that. Like um, he he's still. He still puts in so much effort to educate people about the true history of Okunoshima. Um, and now he has like a, my film as an asset and I'm, I'm happy to contribute, contribute to that. Um, yeah, otherwise, yeah, otherwise um, I know that Miss Okada from my film, she's still healthy. Uh, but Miss Samuel, she hasn't seen her in a while because of Corona. They, they start to, you know, stay distant, but they communicate. Um, with the others, I didn't have a chance yet. I try to reach out to them as much as I can, um, but yeah, I'm currently I'm traveling a lot, so it's not very easy. Um, and Mr. Bu Ping was a great scholar and also a great, I'll say, he really tried hard to bridge the gap between China and Japan. Like he he studied, or he researched Japanese poison gas in China. He learned Japanese for that, um, and he was part of a group of uh, Japanese, Korean, Chinese scholars to develop a joint um, history textbook um, where everything that happened is addressed and where all you know three countries can agree on something. But he passed away due to cancer and with him also like this joint group kind of like stopped and this effort to um, build a lasting uh, understanding between the three countries um, also kind of stopped and um, went back a bit um, and yeah I mean there are still open wounds between all these three countries um, 
not exclusive, not exclusively, but also when it comes to the poison gas related history, of course. Uh, well, it was kind of done in Germany. I'm not not clear on the specifics, but I know that France and Poland and other European countries had a huge influence in how history is taught, especially Nazi history is taught in Germany. Um, and there's still like a special. A uh, contract of friendship, I think it's called, between Germany and France that addresses this issue. And one aspect of that is that German students, German kids, should learn French. Uh, and a group or like a part of French students learn German because the idea is like, hey, we are neighbors. We have a um, shared history, uh, pleasant, bloody, and otherwise. Uh, we should learn the language of our neighbors to understand each other. And I think this is beautiful. Like, as a kid, I really dislike learning French because um, in Germany you learn at least two other uh, languages, uh, mandatory. Now I realize like, this is like super useful. Uh, like when I went to Canada and like, oh, I can understand that. <laughs> when I go to France or other countries. And when I look at Japan, they don't learn Korean, they don't learn Chinese, unless they have like a special interest or like K-pop or whatever. But it's not like super mandatory. But, but what's mandatory is English, but even there it is difficult for many to learn and to apply in Japan. Um, and then looking back at my background, at learning French and English, obviously. Uh, as a kid in school, I think I only later realized the positive side effect of it. And I think if, if Japan, if the Japanese students would learn more about Chinese or Korean, I think they would might have more conversation with them and understand them better. Um, I'm not sure in China how they learn Japanese. I know there are, I had many fellow Chinese students here when I was a student in, in Hiroshima, so like they are, and, and Koreans as well, so they must learn Japanese. But I don't know, like, like the motivation behind it and we were kind of forced to learn French and I think that's a good thing now <laughs> as an adult I can say that as a student I was pretty annoyed because I realized how how important that can be to like build um, build an alliance today last year February I was contacted by a German magazine that I really like and that I always wanted to work for and they found me and realized okay I'm specialized in Japan stuff and I know stuff about Japan um, and they wanted to do a piece in the magazine about Burakumin. Burakumin are a minority in Japan that are indistinguishable from non-Burakumin like Burakumin and other Japanese people look the same um, talk the same, speak like the same language, but it's a um, somewhat artificially created minority. So they contacted me last year and I didn't feel super prepared for it because um, I was in Japan at that, that time and uh, Japan was still closed off, is still closed off today. I knew the research going to be difficult, but I always knew about Burakumin from very early on. I heard about Burakumin and how let's say hush hush everything is about about it here um, and I couldn't tell if I had Burakman friends or not because it's not something that you talk about and I saw this as an opportunity first to work with them uh, and also to fill this, this gap in my knowledge about Japan and about Burakman so I started to get an overview um, well, well, what's out there and there's also some <laughs> let's say crappy stuff about Burakman out there and I knew I wanted to talk to people but it was difficult like, to, to do that in Japan and eventually I found a recently published book uh, a uh, dissertation written by a German scholar about Burakman and it was fairly new so it was very recent knowledge and she seemed very knowledgeable so I um, reached out to her and I got the book. I rented the book from the library because it um, <laughs> was a very expensive book. Um, it was like it was like a, a, a sixth of the fee that I would have gotten from the magazine. So I said, okay, I probably can't get the book. But I rented it from the library for six months. I always extended it. <laughs> uh, libraries, great resources. Um, so I read the book, 440 pages of academic writing about Burakumin, which was super fascinating and I condensed it down to 48 pages of notes. And what I learned 
and reading that it's not just about what Akuma in Japan, Japanese society, but also the dynamics of discrimination. And for example, um, it's easy to recognize someone being racist against someone with a different skin color. Um, it's easy to tell why they are othering them, why they are, um, what they pick to discriminate, th discriminate them. But for Akumin, it's difficult to tell sometimes because, again, like there's nothing distinguishing non brakmin from brakmin in Japanese society. So, in the medieval times, in certain areas, they put leather patches on the clothes of brakmin um, to mark them. And I was reading that, and I was thinking about how Jew Jewish people were marked in Nazi Germany. They had like the Star of David on their clothes to mark them to brand them as, as something other, they're Germans and Jews. So here, Japanese people and Barakumen, even though they are the same people, um, because there's no, nothing distinguishing them. And it was just really fascinating how this hatred against this group persists. And to explain, Barakumen is a group of people that um, are descendants from people who did undesirable work, uh, going back to like um, before the medieval times. The jobs were anything that related to like something that was dirty or smelly or had to do with death. So for example um, a butcher uh, or a um, um, grave digger or uh, even tomb keeper, sometimes even beggars uh, and sex worker but also tanners, people who create leather, hence the leather patch on the clothes to mark them. And the the saying was, they deal with something that's dirty and smelly, so they are dirty and smelly, and their blood is tainted. And even though their parents or grandparents or previous generation did it, they are still tainted. Um, so they were living in different hamlets, different settlements outside of the village. Uh, and they only married between themselves, they stayed between themselves. Um, and this persisted until the Meiji times, basically. And the Meiji times, like the the terms that they used for Barakumen uh, was uh, disabandoned and they were called like new citizens but they were like citizens and new citizens so they were still like marked and they were still living in the same settlements basically so and they still stayed among themselves so even though the the official separation of classes was gone and um, uh, abolished um, the people stayed in the same areas and people knew about that um, and in the 1920s, actually almost exactly 100 years ago, uh, the Buraku Liberation League was founded, a organization to fight for the right of Buraku uh, The one of the first, actually the first organization for human rights in Japan, very inspired by movements in Europe at the same time. In the beginning they were very aggressive and that gave them a really bad reputation, but to be honest they got the job done. They, they really help to improve the situation of Brakumen. They still are around, um, but they still they, they struggle a bit because they achieved a lot for Brakumen and um, they helped to create some laws to protect Brakumen against discrimination, but the discrimination still persists. There are Buraku settlements uh, in um, mostly Kansai area um, that are not marked as such, but people know, people from the area know. And occasionally there's like some bad graffiti, like, you know, you should die or we will always hate you. Um, one of the more bigger events uh, that was happening recently was just 2015, uh, where there was graffiti in a uh, settlement in Osaka against Brakumen. And the Baraku Liberation League, they collect like anytime something like this happens, um, they wrote about it, they write about it. And Barakumen, because they are um, basically you to be a Barakumen, there are two options either you self identify as a Barakumen or someone identifies you. And by Japanese law, that's illegal, you can't do that. Um, and it's also very, very mean because they there were some instances where. They were writing about a politician or someone and saying like, yeah, his ancestor was Brakumin. Kind of implying like he's a no good. And it's, it's kind of insane that they are discriminated and that they have to suffer 
because of some artificial rules of like centuries ago but it still exists um, but at the same time the Barack Liberation League there are less and less people that are actively engaging um, and less people that openly identify as Barack men there's not like a Barack pride thing or anything because they can't pass as non Barack men and many avoid having to deal with that issue which I honestly can understand um, that I mean do you really want that happening to you every day or being afraid that someone will out you or discriminate you or hate you openly or just try to live your normal life um, so yeah, I researched that I interviewed the scholar and finished the first draft last year and the editor was was happy with that like we were like both not really happy that I wasn't able to speak to a document because I couldn't reach one from Germany no one was willing to, to openly talk about it. I, was, I reached a document professor in uh, Kyoto but she had some bad experiences with the media talking about it so she wouldn't talk to me which is you know fine understandable and initially we said okay we just run the story um, and just write hey despite trying several times we couldn't reach a document but eventually the magazine said like hey you can't write about a minority without talking to the minority and I totally agreed so back to uh, trying to reach people uh, I wrote letters this time not emails but letters to the Barack Liberation League um, hoping to reach someone that way got no reply then I asked a friend in Kyoto to visit the Buraku Liberation League offices they like, yeah they got my letter and they weren't sure what to do with it and they were still discussing what to do about it uh, so eventually he convinced them you know Fritz is a decent journalist um, you should talk to him so then we had like a zoom meeting whether there's not an interview but just a zoom meeting so they can understand my intentions like what I was trying to do and a month or so later I got an interview with the General Secretary of the Barack Liberation League which was pretty unusual they said to me they don't give interviews um, especially not to foreign media and yeah I was sitting with him it was very it's a very serious interview you, um, and but I was very happy that they were giving me the time and I finished the the interview was in January I finished writing around March then the war in Ukraine started so the magazine pushed it back a little and just this week they wrote to me like hey now the uh, article is online and I was talking to my friend who went to the uh, Barack Liberation League offices how we should proceed and I wanted to write to them but he suggested that we should just go to the offices and say like hey here's the article because um, overall I think they were pretty happy that I was writing about that that I told them you know I want to tell people in Germany who never heard about this issue um, but Brackemann, please help me to tell them your story um, so yeah I want to like be thankful for that support in their time and like properly you know visit them meet them um, they also said they want to write about me in their Baraku uh, paper uh, which is fun and what I enjoy so far I mean the article is just out for like two days um, there are many comments on the magazine's Instagram page and many said like I never knew about this I never heard about this I can't believe this is still happening in Japan and the magazine is aimed at young people like 20 to 35 um, and was, that was yeah I was very happy about that because to me Burakumin was always something that I kind of heard about but also now on Twitter, after I shared my story and um, the article, that's just in German, unfortunately. Um, I feel like every time I share a story with you, <laughs> it's like either like not published yet or it's in German. It's very hard to enjoy for like non-German people. Uh, but the article is in German. Google Translate is doing a wonderful job, I heard. Um, and I re get these reactions on Twitter, and like even people that follow me or that interact with me who have a general a good general understanding of Japan they have never heard about Barakumin so it's very it's something that's very unknown um, even to people who know about Japan even to Japanese people and I ask my Japanese friends do you know any Barakumin? I said no it's like I never talked about it and it's just like such a invisible minority and a very secretive issue and I'm I'm glad I was able to write about it and 
Yeah, I think I learned a little bit about humanity, how, how and why people discriminate. And I think the scholar that I interviewed put it best when she said that society always needs a group of people to look down on, so they feel better about themselves. She said that in Germany, this group of people, besides like the occasional racist outbursts against like Turkish or Syrian minorities, um, that we in Germany look down on unemployed people. That's like, we, you don't want to end up there. And this really made me think, because um, this was used as like a, not as a threat, but more like as a cautious tale of, of, by like teachers, like, hey, you don't want to be, you don't want to end up unemployed. Uh, you don't want to like live off like social welfare. And it's a bit different to America, but also not, because it was always like said like you don't want to end up there. And I was just in Ilomichi for the week, and the people there, many people there are kind of like living their dream lives, um, opening a small shop or something, and they're not super busy, um, and the shops are not crowded, so I don't think like they getting like super wealthy with their business, but they are happy. And I think that's that should be like the cautious tale. Don't live like like that you don't live the way that you can be un, that you will be unemployed later. Live the way that you can be happy. Live the way that you are not unhappy. That should be the goal. And I think the, this goes as well for Brockman. Um, many who don't openly identify do it because they want to be. For them, that's the answer to how to be happy. Um, and if they choose like that, they should. I came to this realization, I think, last year that almost all the stories that I do are strongly connected to the theme of identity. Because that's something I think about a lot. Um, and I can see parts of myself in every story that I do. Um, and something that resonates with me and ideally resonates with an audience. Um, and when I talk to people, I like to talk about that as well and share that with them as well. And with Rakumin especially, I told them, I'm, even though I'm a cis white male from Western Europe, you know, as far as the discrimination goes, I'm at the very end of the spectrum. But in Germany, I'm somewhat of a minority because I was born in East Germany. I'm East German and my situation in certain areas is, has a disadvantage uh, compared to West Germans. And I still feel this. Uh, 13 years after unification, I still feel this. And I just had a... Uh, has a um, I was reminded of that when I was traveling with the West German TV crew recently. It's like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm of a different group. Even though I'm German, I'm East German, and I'm a minority in Germany. And I said this to them, and I think they could understand me. I'm opposed to much less hatred than they are, and my issue is, is far more insignificant to the hatred that Brockman receive. But I think they understood that I, on some level, can understand being the other person. Besides, of course, like being a foreigner in Japan. Uh, but then again, like I know so many other foreigners in Japan, um, and even between them, there's like I feel like there's certain levels of like being able to speak Japanese or how you approach the country or how you are engaged if you have a Japanese partner or not or children here or whatever. Um, so the more I think about that, the more I realize like we are all pretty much different and we all cling so hard to what makes us um, equal to our fellow to the other people. Like we are the same, we are from that country, but deep down we are all very, very much different. And I get the social need to be part of a group. And one reason, or like one way a group can define itself is by othering others. We are this group because they are not in the group. Um, and yeah, I understand that, but I also dislike that, but I try to be very, very conscious who am I, and what what kind of group am I part of? Um, and when I talk to them, I try to emphasize that, you know, hey, I'm a minority as well. Um, and I think learn a little bit about, because like I'm East Germans and West Germans, there's no <laughs> visible difference between them. Similar to Barakman, non-Barakman. In language, yes. 
Um, and that's why I had this like two weeks ago. I said a word that's almost exclusively used by East Germans. And they were like, oh, you're from the East, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I am. And okay, wow. <laughs> it's like 30 years after unification, like this is still going on. Um, so yeah, it's just something I'm very conscious about. The way I choose my project is, first of all, it needs to be, it needs to resonate within me. Uh, I never choose a project where I'm thinking, okay, that's trendy or like lots of people wouldn't be interested in that or there's a huge economic value. This is of course a part of it, but it's not the, like, the first, first aspect of it. Um, and again, coming back to identity, I think about, I see something and I think, okay, oh wow, that's interesting, oh, that's cool. And then, secondly, I ask myself, okay, why do I think this is interesting? Why does it resonate with me? And I search within me. And sometimes that answer is something that can connect with other people. Um, for example, the research I've done on Amichi is about Akia, about empty houses in Japan, about, but it's also about like young people moving to a place, making something new about themselves. I moved to Japan the first time in my early 20s, um, trying to try something new, and I can totally relate to that. Um, and I think it's something very human, the desire to go someplace to create something, a place for yourself. And that's one thing. But also I think it generally ties to like a bigger issue of like living in a late stage capitalism society. Um, where Germany and Japan have similar issues with like depopulation in um, countryside areas, rural areas, people moving to the city. Uh, and when I see like all these pieces of the puzzle, <laughs> It's like, okay, this is interesting, this is connected to society, this resonates within me, this is a human element, this is like someone who does something extraordinary, it's like, there you go, there's the story. <laughs> and then you just have to, just have to go there and do the research and meet the people. Um, and I make it sound very easy and sometimes I think it is, <laughs> because there's so much, so many great stories out there, but I think to find something interesting and to be to be able to uh, rationally analyze and voice why this is interesting, that's the hard part. Because everybody can so like say like, "Hey, this is cool. Let's go there." Um, and I think I'm more interested in like, why is this cool? Why is this cool to me? And why is this interesting to other people? Awesome. Thank you so much. Do you want to get the sunset? <laughs> that's fine.